John Esser. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Esser. I work for Advanced MD, a medical uh, uh, software company, uh, SaaS Software. Um, as far as kind of areas, I guess, would be uh, DevOps leadership transformation. I come from a perspective of a senior management, executive level uh, type uh, perspective, so probably a good types of questions that I can answer. Hi, I'm Gwen Dobson. Uh, I work for a local nonprofit called Waterford Institute. Um, we make applications for early uh, childhood learning. Um, I started my technology career uh, doing support and um, about, oh, mid-90s um, and quickly moved on into the arena of quality and testing. Um, did that for the last couple of decades and um, now I'm moving more into the IT operations side. So um, I'm, I'm a practitioner of a lot of this. Um, I've been in the software world for a long time. So technology services and, and uh, support is, is something I've, I've lived and breathed for a very long time. So I've seen a lot of, of evolution over the years. So. Howdy, everybody. Wes Novak. I'm a systems engineer at Pluralsight, which is a technology learning platform. Um, I am happy to share the way that we do uh, operations. We do you know, cloud ops, DevOps, SysOps, me personally. Um, we've got DevOps engineers and systems engineers uh, at Pluralsight, and we share a lot of responsibilities and roles there. So happy to bring our perspective to the discussion here. Um, prior to Pluralsight, I worked at Verizon working on a team that did uh, web hosting for the, uh, essentially the entire uh, Verizon enterprise. Any development teams that needed web hosting would come to us. So um, I've got a lot more uh, enterprise type IT perspective there to share as well. So thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Corbin Ron. I work at Instructure. Uh, <laughs> many of you have probably heard of Canvas if you uh, currently go to school, anything like that. Um, I worked on the ops team for a long time, did a lot of embedding, and I've actually recently moved over to uh, one of our products called Bridge to do full embedding. We're trying to kind of build up our SRE team. So a lot of the things that I've been doing recently are um, trying to make deployments easier for engineers. Also, um, yeah, just kind of start to finish. My name is Mike Davis. I'm director of software engineering at VirtuStream. That's a subsidiary of Dell EMC now. I've been with EMC for about eight years. We uh, do a DevOps build run. We are in the monitoring space, so we have a lot of knowledge about a lot of the vendors upstairs. Um, and before that, I've done dev and operations for several years for several companies. OK, fabulous. So. Uh, for those of you who are, are coming in, any question goes, as long as it's within the code of conduct and it's relevant to DevOps. So I just have to say that just in case. It would be me who'd ask something dumb, quite frankly. So let's get started. You know who our panelists are? Uh, questions? OK, you guys, you have to do this. Don't I'll start it off with, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> All right, yeah, go ahead. So one thing each of them wishes they knew before they started implementing DevOps. Okay, go for it. Uh, for me, it's more about the executive uh, being on board with that. Um, the executive team are the ones that drive the priorities, and if they don't understand how DevOps works, they can break it very quickly. So without gaining their support and understanding of what DevOps is, it's really hard to roll it out. Um, I think I would have liked to know how important it was to build relationships. Um, specifically with the developers I've been working with before trying to implement it. Um, that can go a long way when you're trying to implement something new like that and you don't really have a relationship built up yet. You can get a lot of pushback. Um, a lot of uh, pride comes out and sometimes you just have to swallow it, including myself. And I think that would have been nice to know. It would have made my life easier if I figured that out ahead of time. Yeah, I'd like to uh, kind of echo that sentiment. There, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about empathy for uh, various roles and uh, building relationships, and uh, a, lot, a lot of the DevOps culture talk. And that's that's obviously super important. You have to have the different uh, stakeholders involved, building relationships, and get them to understand, you know, 
why, why are we going this route? What's it, what's it going to bring um, to the table for everybody? How is it going to improve everyone's lives? Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges that has come up in my experience has been trying to define what DevOps is uh, in the organization that I'm in. Um, each organization is so different, and trying to define whether DevOps is a discipline, whether it's a person, whether it's a team, whether it's a title, and what goes along with that and what that looks like in each organization um, it was a very big challenge and, and continues to be a challenge, I think, across the board in DevOps um, as we try to kind of define uh, what it is and how to fit it into the existing organization. Uh. So I think uh, I've been through a couple of transformations, uh, but before the first one, the one thing that I wish I had known was to not create a team called DevOps. Anything else you would have wished, John? No other wishes? What? That's your, that's no other wishes. Oh, got it. Okay. Other questions? Other questions? This, and then I'll grab you. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm in QA, and I'm currently trying to implement some automation changes. And, um, but Based off of what was said earlier by, um, you know, one gentleman spoke, and it was encouraging to just get your first test in there, and, and then you'll be able to get hundreds or thousands. And then the other gentleman spoke and, and said that, um, you know, there's a lot of problems with the tests and false negatives and stuff like that. So, um, I, you know, I've got some automation running in Jenkins, but what are your thoughts on actually me pushing that to be part of, you know, build um, or release cycles, or do I just keep running my automation in there for my own benefits? And anyway, thoughts on that. Okay, who, want, who wants to take that? I can start. Ooh, awesome. So first off, shout out to QA. <laughs> um, so uh, testing in this DevOps world is, is interesting, um, and, and automation is, is a challenge in and of itself, just because it, Developing the right kind of automation um, and the developing the right tests that, that are easily automatable and, and will continue to pass um, in the right scenarios and not produce a lot of false negatives and false positives. Um, it, it's, a, it's an art form. Um, but I think uh, one of the things to think about is as you are working with your developer, first off, it shouldn't just be you <laughs> building these tests, right? Um, and, and hopefully that's one of the things that we, we talk about throughout this, this um, conference is, is really working together with development, working together with, with operations, and making sure that, that we have the right tests at the right time, um, and that those tests are adding value at the right time. So um, I think if you, can, if you can kind of go into it and plan with that at the forefront of your mind, um, that can help. Did anybody else want to contribute on the panel? Sure, I was just going to mention that uh, if you're having trouble um, deciding whether to you know, insert a particular test or set of tests into the deployment pipeline, you know, have a, a meeting with the, the owner, the development team owners, and, and determine with them you know, in a partnership what is important, what, what should we always test, what should always be the most critical thing so that you get their buy-off to you know, make sure that these things are important and not just, you know, a waste of anyone's time, so. Other questions? I think we had one here. Yes. So, um, it, these kinds of transformations could be led from an executive level where the executives decide we're going to make this change. They could be made from, uh, where you could try to institute them by having tools. We're going to implement this new tool and that's going to cause us to be DevOps but we can all agree that like, there's a cultural element that needs to happen. So if you uh, did something that addressed the cultural issue of changing from uh, like a dev throws a wall over to operations to a DevOps model, and you had success with that, share what you did. So, um at Instructure, we, we, had like, we have an operations team and then we have different development teams. I was uh, 
the first person in operations who decided to actually go, at least you know, a year or so ago, to go in bed with different uh, development teams. And I think for me, that was probably the biggest cultural shift. Like we had, because you know, having executive buy-in, obviously you have to have. Like that's a huge, huge thing. If you don't have it, it's gonna be really hard to move forward. But when I actually moved over, sat with the developers, and they saw what I was doing, and I was helping them, and I was hearing what they were complaining about, and they heard what I was complaining about, there were lots of things, like little light bulbs that just went off, and like, wait, that's a problem for you? Yeah, that's a problem. And then having every, like, even people just walking around seeing that happen um, completely changed the culture, at least on the bridge team, the team that I'm currently on. Um, it changed their perspective, it changed how they talk to ops, um, it changed my perspective on how I, I feel about ops, um, and you know, working more with engineers actually doing engineering. Um, I think that was one of the biggest takeaways for me, was getting in there, working with them, really is at least one of the biggest ways for me to, to change that. Yeah, we did something very similar. We had a guy from Apple come over uh, from Siri, and he brought with us the micro team. You guys have probably heard this concept with the DRI. But it's the idea that you get operations development, QA, everybody, but it's a very small team with a very unique purpose. We were actually never successful at actually having a micro team complete its project, and that was an executive level problem, right? They couldn't stay focused long enough. But we did learn a lot of good lessons, and the lessons we learned were when we get those people in the same room having conversations, we find out that a lot of them are trying to solve the same problem, but each one of them is trying to do it in a silo. And as soon as we got them in the same room, a lot of problems started getting solved. Um, yeah, I think uh, as far as uh, successful strategies for, for that cultural shift, you have to try to get everyone to uh, get away from this separate team mentality and you know, get away from that silo mentality, obviously, and, and get these teams to think about themselves as, you know, extensions of, each, of one team, right? So be, be all part of the same, you know, happy family. Um, attend each other's meetings. Have guilds where best practices are shared. Those are some of the things we do at Pluralsight. We have guilds on various, uh, you know, uh, different topic areas that we, we meet as, you know, various product development teams and ops teams and DevOps teams members. And, uh, you know, embedding, embedding people in, in the same team, even for temporary projects, I think is super helpful as well, as uh, my colleague here mentioned. And, uh, you know, just get over, get, get, try to get your people into that mentality that uh, you're all one big, one, one big team, communicate, maybe sit, sit closer together to get that uh, shared understanding going a bit better, and keep that up. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this, this question, I mean, your question is kind of at the heart of, of the whole, whether it's successful or not, right? So it's very core. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times what I see is we attempt when we do a DevOps, you know, we roll it out, executive, whatever, at whatever level, you would, they start at process and tools, okay? They start at really the lowest level. And they think that by, by adopting a tool, or some kind of a process, even something like Scrum or Agile, is going to change, right? And I mean, even at lunchtime, I talked with several people that said, "Oh, we say we do Scrum, but we're not, we're not a cross-functional team. We're not, you know." So there still isn't change happening, even though you say you do those things. And so what I would suggest is, at whatever level, executive level, or the, at, at an upper level, that they really talk a lot about the mindset. Okay, what, what's the mindset that you need to have, right? What's the different way of thinking? Um, what's, you know, what, what is it about value delivery that's different in the way we're approaching it versus what we're doing today, right? And really having a lot of discussions and immersion in that mindset, once people start to actually get, get that mindset and, have, and be able to discuss that, the rest of those things will start to fall in line much more easily. Uh, for those of you who are up on the balcony, I'm going to walk the mic back in the back and then I'll come back up. You guys can shout out questions as well. Just raise your hand so that I know that you want. I have someone back here and then I'm going to come back up here. This is great. We have more questions. So here we go. I'm Daniel Mejia. Uh, I work for Prestige Financial Services. 
And my question is, um, is your company ADA compliance? And if you know, or if your company is, uh, what tools are you using to, to become ADA compliance? Okay, ADA compliance. Um, panel? I actually have a question for him. I actually don't know what that stands for. I should know. Now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Sorry. No embarrassment here. That's how we are in DevOps. <laughs> it's hug ops. I was so, thinking something like uh, HIPAA or something when you mentioned that. Any, anyone on the panel know about that? Anybody in the audience, can you answer that briefly? We're going to crowdsource for a second. Anybody who has any information about ADA compliance and DevOps, up top, do you want to just shout it? So I, yeah, so I, I'm not aware of any tools that are specifically for, um, but I, I will know that historically um, we have had um, teams do searches and do comparisons with other sites, and there are best stand practices and um, standards that are out there and documented that you can use, um, but it's, I'm not aware of any any automation or, or tools. We have a hand raised, possible crowd, uh, crowdsource answer. Oh, you do as well. Let's get, let's get him and then we'll, no, no, you go. So um, I work for one of the credit unions here in the area. And uh, within the last year, we had an issue where, you know, it was, it was cusping onto a lawsuit about ADA compliance with our mobile banking app. And, uh, you know, what I saw from that, so I don't necessarily have any tools for that, but I think that what we had to do is make sure our compliance office was working as part of that team. So, you know, there's a smaller team that's trying to work towards making it, but there's all these other priorities of features that people want out. At some point, the compliance officer had to insert themselves into this saying, no, those features are not coming out. You're going to make this compliant, and we're going to tell the legal representation of that group that this is coming out and this is the date we're going to hit with it. So again, those are old things, you know, hitting a date. Um, the features weren't what people wanted, but it hedged off the lawsuit and compliance was working with them to make sure that they understood we're trying to comply. And then the development team had to shift gears to make sure that that happened. So not an automation tool, but the legalese of that was really important for us getting past that. Yeah, and, and the collaboration. So I will, Merlin, if you'll get with that gentleman after, I'm going to kind of move us on onto another question. Okay, Utah State no, University. Nothing automated. Great. Okay, and if you want more answers, Merlin is always a wealth. So thank you, thank you, thank you both of you for contributing. I had a couple questions up here that I bookmarked. I'm going to grab the, Mr. Batten, and I'll keep moving us. Go. So, John, uh, you mentioned your do-over would be to not create a DevOps team. What if you already have one? Oh. Ouch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, well, okay. So the, the basic, right, consultant answer, it depends, I guess, right. No, um, I think that's really tough because I think at that point, if you already have one, you really need to look at what it, okay, so there's the name. And I think what happened was in the situation was that everyone identified with DevOps being only in that team. So it really stifled the adoption of DevOps across the organization. And really what that team fundamentally was, was a tools team. It really maintained a set of tools, okay? And so, um, but because they had that name, it kind of, everybody, oh, well, that's DevOps, that's DevOps, right? So um, one is maybe just change the name of the team to what it is they do, because I would highly doubt that they're really the only people doing DevOps in the group. If, if that is the case and the, and the company isn't really adopting DevOps because there's this perception that it's in this little group here, then I think you need to talk to somebody about 
yeah, changing the name, um, doing something like that, possibly, right, even the idea of depending on what they do, uh, how centralized it is, you might need to go as far as breaking it up or something, making it, uh, you know, so my, my thoughts. How large is your organization? Sorry? Under 700. So how, and, and how large is the team? Oh, sorry. How large is the team? Okay. All right. So um, the thought that comes to mind is there's an opportunity there for that group of people to serve as your DevOps champions for the organization um, and to have them kind of go out and not necessarily serve as a team, but dissolve the team and spread them out amongst the other, the other groups and actually have them mentor and guide and, and influence um, that transition. Okay, I think we have a, another answer at the end. So we had uh, three SRE teams. All three SRE teams had different skill sets, different purpose. So when they said they were an SRE, you really didn't know what they meant. So in that case, what we had to do is they all had to come up with like a manifesto or a mission statement or a purpose and said, this is what we do and this is how we do it, right? So yeah, maybe it's not a good idea to be called DevOps, but if you are, then come out with a purpose and then communicate that with everybody and do it in a fun way, right? Okay, so some creative answers to about 700 people, 10 man DevOps team. What do we do if you don't have a team that's called DevOps? I think he had one and then I'm gonna Grab you. No, you should keep asking questions. Go ahead. So um, as my company transitioned to DevOps, and as we did that, you know, a lot of the structures went away, and something that suffered a lot was documentation because everyone was, you know, everyone had, in their silos had their place to go. Um, so how do you make sure that everyone is documenting and that, you know, do you try to ensure that there's some sort of standard for documentation across the organization? So... I can tell you what I tried that hasn't worked. Um, so we tried to do documentation as you code or in your code, right? And that doesn't work. Um, we've tried one day a month. We called it D-Day, documentation day. That's all you did. That didn't work. Um, so we keep trying new processes. But the important part is um, trying to get them to understand the importance of the documentation. I mean, we all know that the, the best way to do it is to do it while we change the code. If we're going to go change this function, go change the documentation, right? Um, but that's really hard to do and get into practice. So you just either have to make it part of your process or you've got to incentivize or try to come up with unique ways to do it. That's what we're trying to do. Anyone else on the panel? Okay. You have a question and then I'll come back to you. You're next. Mine's not a question. I just, our team just went through the whole my name is DevOps thing. So for anybody that's about to do that, don't do that. Because first of all, here's the first thing. DevOps is a practice. So why would you name your, unless, the, unless that name is going to encompass the entire engineering effort in the whole company, then it doesn't make sense to call your team DevOps. That would be like if you had a martial arts team of like people practicing karate and the name of your team was karate. Like it would only, you see what I'm saying? Like if it was team karate, that would, but anyways, so. So from yeah, someone who knows, that. who's done it, says don't name yourself DevOps. Make it for everybody. Good call. All right, sir in the back. My name is Jason Miller. I'm curious, in your maturity as you went through DevOps, what was one of the biggest blocking or most memorable blocking issues that you ran into and how did you clear it? Big blockers and how do we move them? Anybody want to start? At the end? No. That's what we're here for. So uh, we have a, a quarterly planning that we do to make sure that we're on task and moving forward. And I would send out questions to the team beforehand. If you had to do this from scratch, what would you change? And we always got back answers, but we never did anything. And then we finally made a decision, we're actually going to do that. And one of them was to completely rewrite the whole thing. Um, now, sometimes you can't get support from your dev. Sometimes your timelines don't support that. But a lot of times you have to look at what you're doing, compare it with what everybody else is doing. There might be a better way. Welcome that 
and accept that maybe you need to just break ties and start from scratch on something new. Take it really quick. Um, I think one of the biggest blockers when um, I was first trying to do this was actually me. Um, there was a, as I'm sure a lot of you know, or have in operations, an application can go down and all of a sudden you're stuck with having to try to figure out what this application even is. It's been up for three years, you get paged, you're woken up in the middle of the night and you have no idea what's going on, but you're an ops and it's your responsibility to go figure out what's happening. We had this happen on an application. I happened to be on call and I found out that it uh, was an application that was deployed with something we didn't typically use. Somebody else had created it. It was an internal thing. We called it shadow ops. You know, I was freaking out. What's going on? Um, in the middle of firefighting, I was typing in Slack, you know, saying things like, why didn't you come talk to us first? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Not helpful. That wasn't at all helpful. It actually caused a lot of, uh, initially it caused a lot of problems. Um, finally, one of the developers just said, man, we just got to get this application deployed. You know, we, we, have, we have these deadlines and we don't know what to do. We, we just need your help, man. So I calm, you know, calm myself down, went, all right, we figured out the problem. And then I had to you know, essentially swallow my pride, talk to the developer and said, you know, what's going on? Like, why did you guys do this? What's happening? And they were just you know, found out they were given all these deadlines. They were, you know, have to get a um, new feature out, new feature out. They were promised by somebody who left the company that this was going to help them, something that they built, and it blew up in their face, and then Ops was stuck trying to figure out how to help them with it. That's actually how the first embedding happened, at least for me, was I went to their team and said, I'll do whatever I can to help you figure this out, and that's kind of how the collaboration started. But initially, there was definitely that hammering of heads, and I personally had to suck up my pride and kind of calm down and realize that these are just people too who are trying to do their job. I don't know what they're going through and they don't know what I'm going through. So, uh, I feel like a lot of people might say culture would have been a blocker, but I've been fortunate to um, be working at Pluralsight for a long time now and uh, we've had a very high focus on DevOps culture from the start, so that has not been a blocker for us. So. Um, not necessarily a blocker, but maybe uh, what's, what has slowed us down and probably slows everybody down is, you know, just learning all of the tools to enable that uh, deployment pipeline and getting your automation in place and safe and separating out concerns for different teams so that they can move faster on their own, doing their own things. How did you remove that blocker, though? What did you do? Uh, it just takes time. It takes time for people to learn the tools and experiment and figure out how to do things the right way and learn from their mistakes, et cetera. Nice. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that I've experienced is really around the natural tensions that exist between these different groups. Um, you know, you have developers who um, are creating and, and they're building the new stuff, right? And, and they're relying on, in many cases, they're relying heavily on their test teams to to um, assess quality and, and to make sure that they look good at the end of the day. And sometimes that doesn't always work out for any number of reasons. And then you have ops who, you know, gets, gets whatever comes out of all of that at the end of the day. And they have to try to figure out how to support it and to keep it secure. And, and so, you know, all of these teams have years and years and years of built up tension. Um, and just getting them to, to set all ego aside and have a conversation with one another and respect each other as human beings is a really difficult task at times. Um, and in terms of overcoming that, I think the only thing that I've found is you have to create spaces where it's safe for each of those teams to kind of open up to one another and to kind of get to know one another and understand what challenges they each have from their different perspectives. Um, and then lead by example, right? If we can't expect our teams to to automatically make that shift if we're not willing to kind of put our ego aside and, and come to the table um, and open those doors. Well, I already mentioned one big blocker, which was that, which is having the, the team be called DevOps. Uh, and I want, you know, um, some other, you know, like this gentleman here that 
expressed it, it, it did so much damage long term um, that it really, you know, at, at some point you kind of had to kind of had to reboot, restart, um, because it some of that had gotten ingrained in the organization and the mindset, and then you just had to kind of start over. So that was a huge mistake that really ended up being down the in, in the beginning was a good intention, but it ended up being a real impediment down the road. Um, beyond that, secondly, I would say is probably probably the litmus test for a successful DevOps implementation or transformation is the increased value delivery, right? The increased rate of, I mean, why else are you doing it? It's not just only communicate, it's, well, what's the purpose of the communication, the enhanced communication, the different team interaction? It's to increase value delivery to customer and to increase that their satisfaction. And um, when, when I think, you know, once you kind of get through some of that, the mindset and the culture, you begin to do that. Uh, honestly, the thing that I see the most that impedes organizations is application architecture. Right, technical architecture, because when you start to in, ex, try to accelerate, you realize you're, you're now up against application architectural issues. Okay, thank you. Another question. Oh, okay. I'll grab him and then I'll grab you. We already put on the retrospective more mics for next year, just so you know. Uh, so the question is, what is your... Uh, go-to resource for keeping current on the environment and the changes in DevOps? Anyone? Oh. Configuration management. So the more specific question is really where do I go to stay always up to date yes. With the movement and with the tooling, where do you guys go? Where do you get educated? Hacker News? No, but a lot of reading research, right? That part of my day is doing that. Um, you need somebody in the organization that's always doing that, right? And somebody that's especially leading DevOps teams, staying ahead of what's coming or at least trying to keep up with what the industry is doing. So you've got to do a lot of research, a lot of um, reading. I don't know another way. Anyone else? Uh, personally, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I hear about a lot of cool new tools and uh, developments via my podcast feeds. But obviously, you know, coming to events like like these, you know, networking with your peers and talking to them about what they're using, finding out, you know, what's worked for them. And uh, again, I work for Plural Sites, so I obviously would uh, recommend our platform for learning about new technologies. Hey Wes, I'm not clear. Where do you work? Plural Site. <laughs> oh. I'll, I'll offline, what those guys do, I'm not clear. <laughs> favorite podcast. Uh, favorite. With. I don't know if I can say a favorite. A uh, couple DevOps related ones that I listen to. Uh, Arrested DevOps is a decent one. And uh, there are a couple more that I'm totally spacing right now. But uh, yeah. All right, anyone else on the panel? How do you stay educated and up to date? No? Oh, John will answer. Well, so I'm going to answer a little differently because I, and this will sound maybe not super positive, but I think DevOps, you know, it's been around a while, but I think, frankly, right now we're kind of in a, a plateau. There's a lot of different tooling and things that are happening, and you can definitely keep up on tooling. But my own personal opinion right now is that a lot of the initial principles and the culture and all those things have been quite established. And we're kind of in that plateau where the rest of the or rest of the community is trying to absorb it. And so I don't, like when you see some of the leaders in DevOps like Gene Kim, uh, even if you go to other conferences, you know, DevOps uh, Enterprise Summit or as, or you know other folks like Jez Humble, you're you're seeing the same stuff, okay? You're not really seeing new things right now. You're seeing different versions of the same material. So, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, it's going to take a little bit, right, for it to mature, to where I think we'll take maybe another step, right? Um, so, but there's 
I mean, tons of awesome resources out there now. I mean, those guys I talked about, they have great blogs and resources that you can follow. The conferences continue to disseminate. I think one of the more positive things about conferences like this is you continue to hear success stories about how people transformed and how they're adopting those things. And I think those are great uh, sources of information as well, right? Because not there's just no one way to do to do this. Uh, I forgot a couple of uh, email newsletters that I would recommend. I've got uh, there's a DevOps Weekly um, newsletter that I subscribe to. It's an all text newsletter that covers like the week's uh, DevOps news and uh, blog posts and such. And then O'Reilly has a really good newsletter too called WebOps and Performance that you should check out. Uh, just really quick, uh, one thing for me that kept me up on, on newer stuff was actually moving to a different company, was moving from my previous company to Instructure, going from managing 50 servers to a few thousand, that definitely changes your perspective on architecture, on how things have to be architected, what little things can go wrong when you have 2,000 servers running, how often those die, um, definitely changes I learned, I've learned so much working at Instructure just because of that. So I want to reiterate that, but I'm going to ask a question. By raise of hand, who can define what DevOps is? You should all raise your hand, right? Now who, can, who thinks their neighbor has the same definition, right? So I think it's important that we talk to each other, attend these conferences, and try to figure it out together. But I agree that that's what we should do. Did I mention there's a job board back there just as a chaser to, to Corbin? No, we wouldn't want to steal you here. Uh, I did just get slacked by one of my board members. DevOps Days does try to help keep you organized or uh, on the cutting edge as well and educated. So there's our plug for that. Uh, but we do, do try to do that here. We have another question here. So we often try to focus conversations about changes, and DevOps is no exception to that. But I'd like to hear about um, something that you think hasn't changed because of DevOps, and whether that's a good thing that hasn't changed, or maybe a not so good thing. Takers? Uh, Wes works for Pluralsight, if anyone missed that. <laughs> So I just wanted to briefly touch on um, the importance of, you know, the operation discipline. So, you know, it, obviously that, that has not gone anywhere. I think some people might have the misunderstanding that, you know, DevOps means no ops sometimes and that, you know, you don't, you don't need uh, to worry about all the ops stuff because you're throwing it at the cloud and everything's good and fine and dandy, but uh, that's definitely not the case. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, if I were kind of, you know, we had a couple of questions, but if I were to say uh, two of the things that I think that DevOps really, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say almost assaults, okay? The word, it's very strong. When DevOps begins to come in an organization, there are two groups that feel very threatened, okay? And that's operations and typically uh, QA, okay? Because those are two groups that tend to have historically been very centralized and, and consequently, because they're centralized, they tend to be a, a source of perhaps, you know, a bottleneck in some cases, okay? And so when you're trying to accelerate, right, those are two things. In fact, in many cases, how many, you know, have been in an organization, been on the developer side, and really you almost view operations like an enemy, like, they're, they're what makes me go slow, they're, I mean, it takes forever to do X, Y, Z, right? And so, when DevOps comes in, right, the first place people go is, well, how do I get rid of that, right? This, this kind of, this no-ops uh, idea. Well, the fact of the matter is, is it doesn't go away, but it does have to change. There is no question that it has to change, right? The nature of those positions and what they do does need to change, and I think they're the ones that are most most affected, and they're the ones you actually have to work the most with and collaborate the most with, as we've already heard, right, to make that successful. Other questions? I want to reach out to the back of the room, Ooh, or we have the right wing or the left wing, depending on which side of the stage you're on. Uh, come on over here. I might have you guys walk over here just a little bit so I don't burn too many calories. 
Uh, so my coworker had to step out for a minute, but he's actually in charge of our knowledge management organization. And uh, you know, I think he was hoping to find out a little bit more about how you guys have managed to uh, deal with some of the, uh, well, with managing knowledge in a much more fast-paced environment once you implement DevOps. Any clarification? You guys, does it make sense to you? So when you say manage knowledge, what does that mean? Ensuring all your processes are well documented, everything is you know, thoroughly understood across the board, uh, all of your help articles are up to date, so as you're making changes, the entire organization is well aware of those changes. Okay, where do you want to start? Ms. Gwen. So, I mean, I think the reality of it is in this fast-paced world, um, where we're being asked as teams to deliver faster, deliver more, deliver higher quality, d deliver faster, right? Um, one of the things that does get sacrificed is the documentation. And so I think the question that comes up is in terms of looking at knowledge management and making sure that you don't have um, this fear of the bus, right? This um, <laughs> one person has all of the knowledge, and if that person walks out the door, we're, we're hosed. Um, I, I think you have to find other ways to try to share that knowledge across the teams um, that doesn't necessarily... I mean, there's obviously documentation that you can't avoid getting around, right? Um, system information, um, locations of servers, what services are on those. Um, you know, th there are types of documentation that are absolutely critical that, that are must-haves, but... I think when you're looking at things like processes and day-to-day um, -day operational type stuff, um, you have to really question whether it makes sense for that to live in a document um, and whether that adds value to the organization or whether there's a way to have that knowledge be shared in other ways that might be a little more dynamic and kind of supportive of the, the very fast-paced environment. So DevOps or not, I've never heard an organization that says our documentation is good enough, right? It's a documentation is always a problem everywhere. So uh, maybe moving to uh, a, a DevOps way of working um, changes that in a bit that, you know, the particular team, team that owns a, a particular product just might, you know, put their documentation in, in different places. But I think as long as, you know, the team if you have autonomous teams that decide where they're going to put their things, as long as you, know, you avoid the get run over by the bus problem, as long as you have a team that has full ownership and knows where to find their particular docs, I think you're okay. Anyone else on the panel? Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but that does not mean you do not have access to these voices and these conversations. Upstairs, third floor, if I'm facing this way to the left of the vendor hall, we should have a table that says the expert table. So hopefully all of these guys are, and ladies and gentlemen, are up there. <laughs> and go up and ask those hard questions. We also have open spaces. You can suggest different conversations. My suggestion would be as well, um, if you find people who have answers or who have uh, a good way of navigating these questions here at the conference. We have meetup groups. We have your own companies. Invite them, right? If we don't make that community, uh, the conversation gets taken elsewhere. So invite these folks. Uh, and in the meantime, please, a big round of applause and a thank you to our, our panelists.